Ding dong. The witch is gone. But what is at the door? What is at the door? That's always the question when something no. made... The Pinkertons. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, no, they're following her out. They are following her out? Y- yeah. Are they? Maybe. I mean... I, I feel like I feel like that's... I think uh, they're on they're on speed dial still. Oh well, they yeah. they were a contractor probably. Hopefully, oh. <laughs> hopefully. Look, all I'm saying is hopefully the next person uh, understands like a lawyer's probably enough to scare most people. It, genuinely though, like uh, not even a lawyer, just a poorly drafted cease and desist oh, is more than enough. They've been sending those for they've been sending those for years. I don't know why this had to change. I don't know, man. I don't know. The literal Pinkertons are crazy. That's absolutely wild. Uh, but it, obviously, you've seen the the title of the podcast. Uh, Cynthia Williams, the president of Wizards of the Coast, after a little over two years, is re- she's amicably resigning, but probably being told to resign. Yeah, we had some heavy air quotes probably around yeah, that, if you would like. Yeah, that will be obviously. We'll be talking about that later. We also have some changes for Daggerheart. They've done some revisions, some updates, which is very fun, uh, and then some, and then some Baldur's Gate ridiculousness, including some 50th anniversary pre-release stuff for Commander Legends: Battles for Baldur's Gate, and we'll get into some magic leaks and all that kind of stuff too. But we want to start off this episode of the podcast, episode 65 of the Duels and Manadors podcast, as we always do, and introduce ourselves. I'm Connor, and I'm Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Yes. Yes, yes. I would like to have a dungeon one day. Someday. I mean, we do have a... Basement. A half basement, because half of it is underground, half of it's our garage. Yeah, and the half that's uh, and the half that's just basement part is also half a uh, litter box. Yes. So... It's a lot eh. of... It's, it's a surprising amount of litter box. Let's, for, call quarter, let's call quarter litter box. That one quarter of the room. Yeah. Like if you were to... It's still a door. surprising amount of litter box for one cat. Yeah, she's very persnickety about her boxes. Yes. Um... Yeah. Technically, she has four in the house. One of them's in my room. But... And the other three are just lined up next to each other in the basement. Yeah, because she'll use one once, and then if she needs to use a litter box again before I've had a chance to empty them, it'll just be on the floor. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes even, when the litter boxes are completely clean and fresh with clean new litter, she'll sit on the floor anyway. So, anyway... Um... <laughs> I had a cat growing up that that he would he was an indoor outdoor cat he would go out he would go outside to poop and he would dig a little hole and he'd poop and then he'd cover it up. Good for him, right? That would, that's very convenient. That's also what litter boxes are trying to emulate. Yeah, and we need to be patient with our cats in the litter boxes because at the end of the day, they're doing us a great favor by <laughs> by being trained to shit in a very specific location. What about those cats who learn to shit in the toilet? That is so unnecessarily <laughs> difficult to do because you need to get one of those litter boxes that sits in a toilet seat. And then you need to get other litter boxes that have holes in the middle and the holes just get larger and larger and larger so that they learn more and more how to shit just into a hole. Um, that's a whole other a whole, a whole. <laughs> <laughs> other conversation to have. But um, enough, enough of that bullshit. I want to thank, of course, Proxy Forge. For sponsoring this episode of the Duels and Manadorks podcast, Proxy Forge makes high quality match the gathering proxies. Custom art from our friend Tyler. You can use the link in our bio, the beacons link in the bio at the top, and you use that link and you get some cool Proxy Forge proxies. Uh, it'll help us out and it helps out the show quite a bit. He's been going wild recently, got a bunch of new products, and yes. uh, he's got even he got has more coming out with every set of Magic the Gathering. Yes, he does uh one of our one of the favorite things for me is the um the pre con upgrade packs mm-hmm. where you get an alternate art for uh the commander as well as uh cards that would be way too expensive probably yeah. or just weren't included in uh, commander precons and it's just a nice little technically nine card upgrade sometimes i believe it they had that he just has a fancy command tower as well yeah. but it's still a very reasonable price compared to what those cards would be as real cards as singles uh, and you would never see a lot of those cards in precons so it's a nice way to kind of zhuzh up a precon i got the uh he sent us a bunch of cards mm-hmm. and one of the packs that he sent us was for the Kaust um disguise precon from murders yeah. of karloff manor and I used a lot of those to help zhuzh up my Yaris Roar of the Old Gods deck, uh, which slapped on our Monday Night Magic, where we play Magic the Gathering every Monday night. We're trying to move to YouTube. Um, right now, it's kind of low priority compared to podcasty things. So we'll get there. We'll get there. The TikTok Live, man. 
the TikTok life. It it hurts. It hurts the soul sometimes. Everything around TikTok kind of hurts right now. You know, it's been even the government. <laughs> the government's been salty for a while. Let's be fair. But before we get into uh, the various spiels, I just want to pull up uh, Ryan over at Playing With Power. Playing With Power is a CEDH gameplay YouTube channel. They've been going for a while. They have a very uh, successful Patreon. They're very popular in the community. I've met Ryan a couple of times at SCG Con. Uh, he has some mutual friends, and and I've played a game of CEDH with him. The first and only, so far, game of CEDH that I've ever played. Um, he let me pilot his Godo deck, trying to get um, the... Oh my god, the Godo, mu- Helm of the Host combo. Yeah, the, yeah, Helm of the Host combo for infinite combats and winning, uh, which I did, which was awesome. Yes. Um, he sent out kind of a cryptic tweet yesterday, and this is also on his uh, community tab for his YouTube channel, saying, big changes have just come up in my personal life. The channel is being put on an indefinite hold. I don't know when it will be back, if at all. Sorry for such a short notice. I have a paused Patreon. I'll have more updates at a later time. Um, obviously something quite serious is happening and whatever that is, I, I want to wish him well and offer our support, uh, in any way. And, uh, please, if you, if you like the, if you like playing with power, uh, go, go send some love. And if you've been watching playing with power for a while and you're kind of on, on the, uh, on the fence about getting sleeves, they have cool sleeves. Where is my... You can get very cool custom sleeves and play mats and all that kind of stuff playing with power if you want to support them. He is pausing the Patreon, which I, which by the way, by the way, there's a lot of creators out there mm-hmm. that have crowdfunding things like Patreon. And if they go on an extended break, they just kind of like, oh, I'll keep collecting money. And they just don't say anything. Yeah. Or they say like, oh, I'm going on a break. And then they just continue to collect the money anyway. So big, big props to him for, for doing the what I would say is the morally correct thing and being like, yeah. I'm going to stop letting you guys give me money since I know I'm not going to be able to produce for you. Yeah, I feel like there's so much advice out there these days on how to be a creator that, uh, and a lot of it probably would involve around, hey, you know, if, if, you're, go- if you're going on a break, you don't have to say anything and you don't have to pause your Patreon. So to see uh, to see another com- creator who is uh, caring about their community enough to, uh, you know, follow, to do what's right for their community when mm-hmm. they're doing what's right for themselves. Yeah. It's very nice to see. We really respect people, the guys that were playing Power Ryan and his uh, and his others, uh, friends who he works with. So, yeah. We highly, highly recommend go checking out their stuff. Uh, you can watch most all of their content for free on YouTube. So, Godspeed to them. But... Let's get let's get into let's get into our normal pre-show spiel. Sam, what have you been playing recently in the world of? Have you been playing anything in the world of tabletop RPGs in Magic: The Gathering? So, video vid- vid- games. Video games. So last time, uh, uh, I picked back up Doom. Mm-hmm. Be Doom. Got a lot of the achievements. Can't get all of them. I'm, I, I do like to achievement hunt from time to time. I do. T- it has to be the right game. Has to be the right game. Doom is a lot of fun. Um, and I'm pretty much down to just the multiplayer achievements, which mm-hmm. it's a 2016 game. So the people that are playing nowadays um, are tryhards. No offense to any tryhards out there. Uh, but well, I'm a little bit of offense to the tryhards. But I'm not going to get those. Actually, but more, uh, I had an interesting discussion this weekend based around a game that neither of us, I don't think, have played. Have you ever played uh, Dead by Daylight? No, but I've heard very good things. Yeah, so I haven't either. I played, uh, you know, right around the time Dead by Daylight came out, a bunch of those horror games came out. I think Friday the 13th also came out and uh, some others. But anyway, so I was talking, I went to a Tough Mario this weekend, drove down with a couple of our friends, and uh, one of our friends, a new friend of our of mine, um, she said she's pretty big into the in Dead by Daylight, been playing for a couple of years now since it came out. Um, and we were talking and it kind of came out that there or she, she kind of told me about this interesting uh, um, or I drew the comparison to magic to commander format in particular in the way that dead by daylight community also works so in our interesting yeah so in commander of course it's a little different than a one-on-one format mm-hmm. since you know the goal for a casual commander pot isn't for necessarily one person to drive hard to the win immediately that's that's more in a CDH realm, a CEDH realm, or a competitive realm. Yeah. In a casual commander pod, it's more of like, okay, let's feel out the game. How are we doing power levels? You know, what do we kind of want to get from this game? Well, apparently in Dead by Daylight, 
So obvious. So in Dead by Daylight, you have two teams. You have the killer, a single a single player who's you know more of the yeah, arch enemy yeah. of the game, and then four survivors. Yeah, like an asymmetric multiplayer game. An asymmetric multiplayer game, and the way that there is a there is an entire part of the community that Dead by Daylight is naturally a ranked game. Mm-hmm. So like, there's no casual, there's no pubs, but there is a code of ethics that the community has placed around it. And also the creators of the game, I don't know who they are, I don't know who the producer is, but there's a terms of service, um, in the terms of service, they've included basically two rules, as far as I understand, for the killer, um, there is no mechanic, as far as I'm con- 505 Games Behavior Interactive is the developer, by the way. There we go. But, uh, so what my friend was telling me is she was saying that there is a code of ethics and a terms of cert, and part of the terms of service is to follow that code of ethics, which for the killer includes no camping and no, um, tunneling is what they call it. So, um, in Dead by Daylight, the killer, the goal is to down, is to knock down the, uh, the, the survivors and then put them on a hook Mm -hmm. and then the survivor bleeds out from there um in terms of service it literally says that the killer should not be camping the the person on the the person on the on the hook or on the ground um and a lot of she says a lot of the time there's not an issue with this like during during except for the times there is except (laughs) for when uh because they have their their Reset their ranked reset every month on the thirteenth. Mm, so I bet the like tenth to the thirteenth is 13th, just yeah. She said and and that was and I found that very interesting because we used to play Apex. Yes, we yes. played and you know, Apex, Call of uh, uh, Warzone, uh, Warzone. Thank you, and all of those like. If you're playing, you're expected, and especially ranked, you're expected to be playing the optimal strategy. Yeah. Or, or, or close to one. Close to one. There's, there's meta games. You don't want to be yeah. playing something actively off meta if you yeah. can avoid it. And so it's very interesting to me that technically this, this strategy of camping a, a downed survivor would be the meta or the optimal strategy, but because of the way that the game itself is formatted and the, game, the way that the developers aren't implementing a mechanical way to prevent this it's very interesting that this community has come around and said this is how the game should be played mm-hmm. well that's one of those uh community taking ownership of a game that they very much enjoy the only reason that dead by daylight is as popular as it is is like it had very little marketing push there's it's a, honestly quite an old game yep. as well so like the, the community is the one that's keeping it alive so they probably reached the point in the game's life cycle where it's like all right whatever the community wants uh destiny 2 is kind of at that point right now where you can just kind of have and do everything at mm-hmm. this point you can mix and match all the skills you can do literally anything now because they're getting to the end of the life cycle of that game but that's fun yeah didn't know anything it's very it's very interesting com- that compared to what helldivers 2 is doing mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. having constant updates to rebalance things and asking the and asking the community very direct directly what do you want dude helldivers 2 is like uh it could be a master class in video games and just gaming in general um, public relations and mm-hmm. and um, marketing, like they're oh, doing yeah. a they're doing a fantastic job there. They're doing great. Um, I slow continuing to slowly work my way through Persona Five in in my leisure. Uh, also, still working my way through Final Fantasy Seven Remake, which is fun. Uh, we played Outlaws of Thunder Junction last night for our Monday Night Magic live stream. Uh, we took some pre-release kits for Outlaws of Thunder Junction and and uh, pitted them against each other. I was doing Boros, uh, like mercenaries, just kind of aggro. Yeah. Um, and you had like a Naya saddles. Naya thing. mounts, yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty fun. Pretty fun. Uh, I think we might be doing. I think it would be smart to do the pre-release stuff a little bit different, uh, since it's a live stream and we're taking a week to build decks anyway. Like we'll just play with the cards we got yeah and we can be like oh this ca- i have this card that's five cents that works really good with yours that you didn't get so you could just use that mm-hmm. and then you have a 10 cent card that works really well and i'm just going to use that and then like actually kind of build somewhat more optimal decks that play a little bit better yeah uh just because i feel like we both find ourselves kind of on certain games getting stuck not being able to really do much yeah um i think that would just be more entertaining as well uh i also uh, as i mentioned i built the yaris roar of the old gods deck that's a that's a gruel uh disguise morph manifest deck uh he is a very good card 
Yeah. Yaris Roar of the Old Gods is a very, very good card. I mean, just at, for, well, I mean, just let alone just alone a haste enabler in the command zone, great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also gives you card draw, also gives you recursion and and continuous uh, uh, creature uh, entering the battlefield effects. Yes, and it it's so like Impact Tremors was a very important card in one of our games. And it's not, and it's something that I'm like, oh, I knew that was going to be useful because I have a lot of cost reducers for creatures. Since morph and disguised cards are colorless creatures, they mm-hmm. are they enter the battlefield as a creature. They cost three mana. It doesn't matter what color the mana is. So getting enough cost reducers out, like I could just be free casting them if things went crazy. Yeah. Um, and so just I one one interaction that I didn't fully realize when I put impact tremors in was when a disguised or morphed or manifested a face down creature mm-hmm. dies while Yaris is on the battlefield, it returns to the battlefield, so it re-enters the battlefield face down and then flips up for free. That's the biggest one, is that you I'm getting the flipping face up without having to pay the disguise and morph and yeah. manifest costs, uh, which makes it way more efficient. Um, but is a is a fun deck, and it's also very different than any of the other decks that I've made, which yeah. is which was one of my goals with this. Um, I'm also almost complete with uh, my Abdel Adrian Gorian's Ward and uh, Candlekeep Sage background commander uh, Azorius blinking nonsense. Another strategy that I've not really uh, done much before, and I anticipate that one to be very very powerful. Mm-hmm. Uh, it does that combination of commander and background does see some EDH CEDH play uh, at a lower level. It's not nearly as powerful as like the top tier decks. Sure. Uh, and obviously, I'm not building it as a CDH list. Like, I'm not throwing, I'm not throwing a bunch of fucking mana vaults and moxes in there and all this high tier shit. Um, even though I could with all the proxy forge proxies sure. we have, but um, I'm running it just kind of more value based, uh, just blinking constant like. Basically, have an answer for anything by blinking my commander <laughs> is the kind of thing. And then eventually having a ridiculous board state of 1-1 soldiers that I can then swing out with. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get that one online as well because I think that'll be very, very fun. Uh, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of all we got. Of course, let's get into the rundown of the upcoming releases. Uh, before we do, though, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, it goes live Every other week on Wednesday at 12.30 Eastern Time. That posting date might change in the near future when the Patreon gets updated, uh, which would be quite nice. But you can get it, of course, on podcast services around the globe, Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music. We also post the video version of the podcast on our YouTube channel. Uh, We use that to make shorts and clips as well. You can follow us on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Discord, all the various things. Monday Night Magic live streams. We talked about all that already. But Sam... What are the upcoming releases for Dungeons and Dragons and Magical Gathering and Daggerheart? <laughs> I guess so. Uh, so first off, we have Vecna, Eve of Ruin. Uh, that'll be available on D&D Beyond and from your local game store on May 7th with a full retail release on May 21st. Uh, that, will, that will also come with Vecna, Nest of the Eldritch Eye, which is a prequel adventure for lower level up. Uh, for lower levels, pardon me, available with all pre-orders uh, for, and for $5 on D&D Beyond. Uh, next up... Not an adventure, but a coffee table book, The Making of Original D&D, 1970 to 1976. That'll be available on June 18th. And finally, the anthology for this year, Quest from the Infinite Staircase, D&D Beyond, and the local game store release will be on July 9th, with the full release a week later on July 16th. I will say, Vecna Eve of Ruin, they've been ramping up the marketing for that a lot lately. They've been doing a lot of videos on the official Dungeons & Dragons YouTube channel with Chris Perkins and all of them. Uh, It is looking like it's going to be that adventure that we kind of all want it to be. It's like a big send-off for 5e. It looks like it's going to be very, very fun. Um, It's been a while since we've bought some D D books with purpose yeah yeah we've been uh we... I'm, I'm quite interested in this in the the vecna eve of ruin and if i am i probably should be pre-ordering it pretty soon to get the vecna nest of the eldritch eye on D beyond for free instead of spending five to... so yeah and also quest from the infinite staircase is going to be fantastic I mean, all the all the anthology books yes. we've had we have no reason to think they're going to be bad at this point yeah, absolutely they have a fantastic track record uh, next up, we have the one D and D or the new fifth edition, the twenty 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 four revision. Uh, the player's handbook will come out on September seventeenth. The DMG will come out uh, two months later on November twelfth, and then the monster manual will come out 
February 18th of 2025. Um, we criticized the 1D&D releases for being so spread out, and I still want to criticize it for that a bit. Uh, but, apparent, but the 5E releases were also spread out. But they were like a month apart. As yeah, they were. Like they were several. much closer. They were much much closer. But of, of course, in this instance, you know, you're still supposed to be able to use the 14, 2014 revisions uh, <laughs> or edition to play. You know, it's supposed to be simpatico compatible yeah. with yeah. the one D and D updates. But next up, we have the Magic the Gathering. Uh, we have Outlaws of Thunder Junction is out now. Uh, so no. go pick that up at your local game store. Yes, please do. A lot of the cards are very good. Oh, yeah. A lot of good cards. Very, very good. We talked about them last podcast episode. Uh, Those spree cards are going to be fucking cracked for a very long time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Those fit into so many places. But next up in June, on June 7th, we have the pre-release of Modern Horizons 3 with the full release uh, one week later on June 14th. Yes, we have some leaked cards, the Flipwalker archetype cards that have been leaked that we'll go over later in the podcast. Uh, then in July, on July 5th, we'll have the Assassin's Creed Universe's Beyond Beyond uh, boosters available. Yeah, the seven-card the seven <laughs> booster packs. Um, next, we'll have the Bloombrough. Pre, uh, the pre-release for Bloombrough will be July 26th, with the full release on August 2nd. And then finally this year, we'll have Duskmorn House of Horrors. That will be available in Q4 of mm. this year. Mm. We also have Daggerheart on this list, uh, but we don't have an official release date release date it's still in beta you can have like all the all the available stuff for free they are they did just put out uh, we'll go into this in a little bit they did just put out their first uh rules update the major rule they, technically they had a 1.2 version but it was a, like correcting spelling mistakes and yeah. clarifications things like right after it was released um 1.3 has some significant rules changes to it yes. though and we'll go over that but we 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 will dawdle no longer there's big news in the world of Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast president Cynthia Williams is departing Wizards of the Coast at the end of the month. She is leaving the company. Uh, the SEC filed uh, a, sorry, an SEC filing disclosed that Cynthia Williams, uh, president of Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro Gaming, had informed Hasbro that she will be leaving the company as of April 26th, that is three days from the recording of this podcast. Per the SEC filing, Hasbro is conducting a process to identify her successor, quote, looking at both internal and external candidates, end quote. Uh, when reached out for comment, uh, Rascal News was the, f sorry, reaching out for comment to Wizards of the Coast, they say, quote, we're excited for Cynthia to take this next step in her career and grateful to her contributions she has made in her more than two years at Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. We wish her the absolute best in her next endeavor. And we have started the search for the new president of Wizards of the Coast and hope to have a successor in place soon. This was first reported by Rascal News when they found the SEC filing themselves. Cynthia Williams joined Wizards of the Coast just over two years ago, uh, joining Hasbro from Microsoft, where she took over Chris Cox, who is currently the CEO of Hasbro, who was previously the president of Wizards of the Coast. And since then, who doggy? Has it been a clusterfuck at Wizards of the Coast, uh, overseeing the Aftermath Boosters nonsense, the Pinkertons, uh, the layoffs for Wizards of the Coast she was instrumental in? She's talked an awful lot of shit about the staff at Wizards of the Coast uh, in various meetings and clearly doesn't have a firm grasp of uh, the financial situation of Wizards of the Coast, what's actually making them money. We've, um, we've been reporting, we've been talking about this for years where, you know, one of the first things that, uh, one of the very first things that we saw from Cynthia Williams in public, you know, in, in public statements was, yeah, D&D &D is under monetized. We don't want it to be a seasonal, uh, a seasonal purchase. We want it to be a continuous spending environment. Um, that along with, you know, even just uh, uh, at the end of last year during their financial reportings during a meeting, it was reported that she asked somebody, oh, aren't we failing at, at basically, basically paraphrasing here, aren't we failing? And they go, no. And she goes, you're wrong. We are failing. It's like, we're exceptionally profitable. We're actually, we're actually the thing that's keeping Hasbro afloat. Uh, that is the one major thing that she has done successfully is that Wizards of the Coast is exceptionally profitable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to the point that some might say it's oversaturated. And if you look at the most recent earnings reports for the last two quarters, with the next one coming out tomorrow, uh, which will be the day that this podcast is released, we don't have the next earnings reports for quarter, f 
one of 2024 yet but um actually no i believe it's quarter four that they're going to release at toward the end of quarter one and then they'll compile all the quarter one stuff and release it at the end of quarter two is that how that works well, quarter one's already over quarter one ends in, ends in march ends in march oh right duh duh i was thinking i was doing my division of 12 wrong oh. <laughs> <laughs> math is for blockers yeah so this is it, literally literally i don't block in magic um the quarter four and quarter two, uh, quarter three earnings of 2023 were both increasingly down. And I imagine that her resigning uh, is either her response before the public release or the board of Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro telling her she needs to resign before the public release of the earnings, uh, which I suspect is going to be quite down even more. Yeah, if they're... I mean, they had a lot of. There's a lot of success attributed last year, uh, especially to the Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering set, mm-hmm. uh, and also then Baldur's Gate three, Valerian Studios. Um, Very big releases made a lot of money, and Wizards of the Coast is still by far the most profitable part of Hasbro. But then you look at the layoffs, and obviously she would be having input on who on her team would be lay, being laid off. And then you look at the choices that were being made. Yeah, and it's like. You're going to be laying off the lead of your universes beyond section of the company, the the section that's by far been the most profitable part between Warhammer and Doctor Who and Lord of the Rings and countless secret layers. Oh, my God. The change to secret layers being a um, a limited run as opposed to a uh, print, print to order. order product. You can't get secret layers anymore unless you buy them immediately, which is what they want you to do. They don't yeah. want you to analyze whether or not it's a, something that you want. They want you to just get it. Yeah. Um, um, I just saw a uh, uh, another article ba- uh, based around this, but in that article they talked to the head of Larian Studios, um, who was saying, you know, their overall Larian Studios overall experience working with Wizards of the Coast was fine. They, you know, the people that they were working with were great. But now, after especially in, after these layoffs that happened at the end of last year, yeah. he said that there are there's no one left there of the original team they were working with. You know, yeah. Over, yeah, I mean, of course, Baldur's Gate three was in development for years and years and years and years. So of course, some people move on. But he's like, yeah, now after those layoffs, there's just no one, and that's maybe contributed to why they decided to move on with their uh, with their productions. Yeah, uh, we're just gonna we're actually just gonna jump to this now. I was gonna do it later, but. Uh, Larian Studios, the publisher for Baldur's Gate 3, this was going to be part of the wrap-up, they have announced that they do not intend to make another sequel for the Baldur's Gate franchise and want to move on to a different uh, product Mm -hmm. entirely. Uh, Wizards of the Coast, in response to that, of course, said that they were going to be shopping out the Baldur's Gate IP to other developers to see who would want to make a Baldur's Gate 4. Larian Studios stepping away uh, after... (laughs) <laughs> probably the most successful D&D game that's ever been made. Oh, yeah. Uh, by far, and also one that kind of took the world by storm for 2023, even though it was released in August. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it quickly rose through the ranks. I mean, it won so many awards uh, last year. Mm-hmm. Um, people, <laughs> everyone everyone who's anyone on, uh, on TikTok was yeah. like, well, I just uh, spent the last month of my life consecutively Absolutely. peeing in my pants while I romanced... Well, well, I romanced Asterion. Yeah, that is, that is something. But it, Cynthia, um, I would say uh, it's sad to see you go, but it's not. <laughs> Don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. And uh, who, who would we like to be president mm. of Wizards of the Coast at this point? Because I think there are a couple that would do a fantastic job. Uh, but obviously they would not be uh, looking to them probably because they're more creative types. <laughs> I was gonna say any of the designer, the head designers of of Magic I would lo- or D and I would love Chris Perkins. Yeah, I would unironically love Chris Perkins to be the president. I'd like he would he would fix so much shit. I think. But I assume it's going to be somebody that we've never some... heard of because uh, we don't you know know the higher ups in the New York Times yeah. uh, electronic distribution <laughs> channel yeah it's it, gonna be somebody like that it's gonna be some fucking person you've never heard of that's going to milk it for all it's worth I think it would be very I think it would be very smart it you need to have a mix at these companies mm-hmm. you need you need a uh, bean counter 
in charge of things in some way. You need someone who's looking at the financials and making sure that everything is profitable. And I think having someone like a Chris Cox, like a Cynthia Williams, somewhere in the mix is important. Sure, absolutely. But when it's just those people, you get the situation that we have our we find ourselves in now, where Hasbro is bleeding money. The one thing that's holding them afloat is now being milked for more and more and squeezed so tight that suddenly now their products aren't as good anymore, which means they're not as efficient at stemming the bleeding from Hasbro, which makes them want to squeeze even more out of them. Yeah. And it's just creating a vicious cycle of problems. And you need those creatives that are like, we need to push back a little bit and have a certain level of quality with our products that makes people want to buy them so that we can stay profitable in the long term without just trying to get everything out of it that we possibly can. And also, I think a big one is going to be the awareness of the community. And as we mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, there's a there, there's a company that right now is doing that wonderfully, and that's the the Hell Divers Two yeah. um, creators. And and with with since in charge, that was when the OGL debacle first happened. That was like, that was the, oh my god, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. that in in her defense she took over in february of 2022 uh which oh wait yeah that was 2023 to 2024 yeah shit all right yeah that was her <laughs> of course that was so yeah of course so it she was. so but uh uh and so, and then, and then, just you know, the the PR team for for Wizards of the Coast was just having twenty twenty two to twenty twenty three. Carry, I, I got the dates wrong. Carry on. She so she came. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so the PR team was having to do backbends in order to try to fix relations with the community. So hopefully, whoever comes in at least can identify, can look at the trends of the past couple of years and see, and and see where not to put their foot in their mouth. Literally, like literally, they're. It's a company. It's they're going to make mistakes. Just make ones that are forgivable by the community, or ways that you can make it up to the community mm-hmm. without having to entirely backtrack on the on the thing you were doing. Aftermath at, boosters, yeah. OGL, the aftermath boosters. They were so all in on that that it's been fucking up sets since then. Yeah. Okay. They're, that's the reason that there were sub, that there ended up being two bonus sheets for Outlaws of Thunder Junction. And now those cards are like impossible to get at a reasonable price because when you have a one slot where you can get list cards, you can get special guest cards in the list slot. You can get bo- you have an entire other bonus sheet of breaking news. You have an entire other bonus sheet that can appear in the list slot of the big score that are all at mythic rare. Mm-hmm. Like even if the cards are not very good, they're going to be several dollars. So even so, the good ones are going to be ridiculously expensive. Not because they're that good or they're that valuable or that wanted in decks, but simply because you can't get your hands on any of them. And then we're going to see the Assassin's Creed, like we mentioned earlier. They are just going to be doing Beyond Boosters and Collector Boosters. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no Commander decks coming with the set because they expect it to be a, a, a aftermath style set. And it sounds like there just wasn't enough time and bandwidth to create a full set of cards for the Assassin's Creed. Be- there's plenty of stuff that you could have done with the Assassin's Creed. Even mm-hmm. just like the there's so many reprints that you could have done to fill you know the all the whole reprint slot of the set. Look what they did. Warhammer 40k was ridiculously popular and the decks were powerful and people loved that. Yeah. The Lord of the Rings commander decks are fantastic and people love them and they're very powerful. It's just the the arrogance to think, oh, I have this idea for aftermath where we're going to only have mythic rares, rares, and uncommons, and we're going to cut the number of cards in the pack in half by getting rid of all the commons. Uh, And people are going to be so in love with it, and it's going to make so much money because we're going to have half the printing cost, and we're going to sell it for the same or more. And people are like, why the fuck would we buy these? Mm -hmm. And then especially when you bought them and started opening the packs, because we opened an entire box. There are plenty of people you can go watch online. I want want to note, the only reason we bought a box is because we were able to get a box for like $40. Oh, yeah. We bought it several months later. Yes. when When it was cheaper. Uh, and, and still at that price, you still can get it for stupid cheap. And even at that cheap price, even with chase cards like Nissa, they are like seventeen dollars. Even with Karn, mm-hmm. even with these mythics that you can reasonably pull because there's like fifty cards total in the set, 
even with that, the forty dollars is still not worth it. Because then you're only open. You only have the chat possibility to open up these fifty cards. But you again, you're not going to get the chase cards because they're filled with the other 20, 30 cards. Yeah. And so you just open up the same cards over and over. It's like and five copies of Tolarian Contempt. And the reason that people enjoy opening packs is because well, it's gambling. Gambling's addictive. But still, it's that it's that excitement, that fun of not knowing what you're going to get, and and even you know, like there, you can even pop open some. You know, lower lower power, lower rarity things that are still good, still valuable, while you know you're opening for, up for the top end, mm-hmm. and that's what's exciting is opening up, riffling through the cards. But when you're like, ha, do 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 do, oh, and there's nothing. Okay, it's the exact same thing that I got in the last three packs. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's that was so arrogant of them, and they were like, this is going to be so good. We're going to start designing all of our sets around having this, which is why you had like. A crazy bonus sheet for Lost Caverns of Ixalan and a crazy bonus sheet situation for Thunder Junction and an entire set built around it and yeah. it was so this this is also the set that they sent the Pinkertons after a creator for it was right. the aftermath set ludicrous shit yeah. um i hope that i hope that we get someone a little bit more level headed and a little bit more reasonable um someone that can actually turn shit around but I I will not have hope for that until we see it in action. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Moving on. Daggerheart has released their first major uh, update with Daggerheart version 1.3 for beta testing. Uh, this was about a little over a week and a half ago um, as we release the podcast every other week. Can't always be up to date on certain things. But. So it's okay. It's okay. But uh, this is the first one that has some major rules changes for uh, the game. Currently, there's been some uh, decoupling of the damage and the stress mechanics. Uh, There's also a change to DM GM moves and fear, as well as several uh, game wide balancing mechanics. Uh, We're not going to go through everything, but we are going to go through some of the universal changes. Damage thresholds. They adjusted the damage thresholds across all classes, and then stress points are no longer marked when you take damage below your minor threshold. Simplifies the armor threshold hit points decision-making process during combat. Who's been harping on that? This guy. This guy. Simplified it a little bit. Nothing too crazy. Uh, They also wanted to decouple it from stress Mm -hmm. simply because there are a lot of game features and class features that utilize stress as a resource. Yeah. And when you're marking it for damage, you're just pulling away a resource that they could be using for other game actions, which isn't fun. Uh, We also have the GM moves and fear. It changed GM role structure. So you can now choose to make a move or take fear on rolls with fear, not both. This reduces the fear economy and impacts the balance of if slash how much fear is spent on adversary moves. Also streamlined what can be spent on fear, taking weight off of the GM side of play. Simplifying GM play, a little bit less in the resource, but also a bit more efficient with the resource usage and limiting the options a little bit. Um, The last major change, we'll go over a couple more later, is the stress points. Uh, The starting number of stress point slots for all players is now six. Uh, and they are no longer marked uh, when below the minor threshold. So you have a little bit more utility with that resource. Those are the big changes mm-hmm. going on with Daggerheart. What do you What do you think, Sam? Um, so we were going to play a we were gonna we were gonna do a, a beta a beta test of the Daggerheart. Uh, ended up falling through sickness, sickness, illness. Yes. Um, so it's hard to say how these these changes feel. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that uh, I like the simplification of things on the GM side. Um, in the first place, there wasn't a huge amount of things, but there did feel like a few too many uh, things you could do with fear. And a lot of it came down to kind of using fear to justify special actions that you're that you were as the GM were doing, uh, because this this system is built to make the characters feel very powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and using fear, and and I can get the sense of one it it, it you know when you fail when you f- f- whatever with fear then the GM gets to immediately make a move and bank it for later does feel like it's a little much yeah 
Um, yeah. it, it was one of those when you saw it in action with the playtest game that they showed on Critical Role. Um, Matt was able to pull off some very powerful game warping moves mm -hmm. that in the hands of a less experienced GM or one that might be a bit more adversarial with their party yeah. could very easily take over the game from the players. Mm -hmm. um, so I think simplifying that and kind of limiting the options a little bit and streamlining it is just going to be better for the game overall because you're not going to have a Matt Mercer running your table. No. Yeah, you have to be very judicious with how with what you do, and not you know not a, not in Daggerheart alone, but in any sort of uh, GM role. And mm -hmm. I think that's you know, this is this is mechanically limiting it without uh, without chaining the DM to the table. You know? Yes, yes. Uh, so those changes I think are going to be very welcome. There's also a lot of minutia in a lot of the classes of things being renamed or slightly modified. Uh, some of the major changes to the document itself, uh, they are doing chapters instead of parts, and they've also kind of rearranged what stuff goes where a little bit just to make it a little bit more, um, a little bit more flow a little bit better in each section. They've also added some stuff uh, to the introduction section and um, changed up and added some more. Uh, wordings. We also have a new section for rulings over rules because they want to emphasize more the ruling of the game master and emphasize that over the actual specific written rules of the game. Uh, that's kind of more just to emphasize what the core of the game is about, which is about mm -hmm. the narrative and the storytelling and not rules lowering and not power gaming as much. Yeah. Uh, obviously, people are going to ignore that <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> Uh, it comes down to that there are so many different ways to play and everybody likes something different out of the game, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they renamed the safety tools uh, for... And they made a new session zero and safety tools section as opposed to simply a table for all, just a little bit more readable. Moved all those resources to another section, which is fine. Uh, obviously, a whole bunch of changes to the domain cards, the various classes, ancestries, all that kind of stuff. Um... When it comes down to playing, they've done some changes for action roles and group action roles and help and all that kind of stuff. Damage roles are, are changed a little bit, uh, mostly clarifications uh, for rules text. But one of the biggest changes for actually playing the game is the advantage-disadvantage system. So previously it was you were going to roll the 2d12, one hope, one fear, and then if you had advantage, you were going to add a d6 to that roll. If you had disadvantage, you were going to subtract a d6 from the total roll. What it is now... Instead of the D6, you're going to roll an additional hope dice. Yes. So if you have advantage, you roll the additional hope dice, and then you take the higher roll on the hope dice. With disadvantage, you roll an additional hope dice, and you take the lower mm -hmm. of the hope dice roll. Uh, so this will this uh, advantage-disadvantage system will influence more the rolling with hope versus the rolling with fear aspect of the game. Uh, and you, it'll feel much more like the advantage-disadvantage system in a lot of other systems mm -hmm. that people might be more familiar with, and you don't simply just have to add an additional uh, dice to the roll. Yeah, it, 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 both, it both fixes the problem, uh, or the, the desire to have the advantage be a bigger number to help you succeed, but this also helps you succeed more likely with hope, Mm -hmm. And the disadvantage, yes, you're going to decrease the chances of success, but you're also going to uh, increase the chances of failing with fear, which kind of takes that that entire gambit and um, and makes the two ex makes the advantage more advantageous and the disadvantage more extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one of the other more major things that I want to highlight is the hidden condition. Uh, now, instead of just being able to become hidden, you have to spend stress to uh, gain the hidden condition. Um, and then, yeah, obviously the same thing. If you attack a target, then um, you're no longer hidden, that kind of that stuff. So just much like the problem with the rogue where they can just hide as a bonus action forever yeah. and ever and ever. Uh, now, like, hiding requires physical exertion. Yes. And you can't just hide indefinitely as a bonus action all the time in the middle of combat. That would be ridiculous. Uh, so kind of mechanizing that a little bit, I think, is totally fine uh they rebalanced a lot of the weapons and equipment pretty much everything um armor everybody starts with six armor slots and you can't switch armor in danger or under pressure and you cannot carry additional armor in your inventory anymore um i think just having more slots is probably 
better the way to across go. the board. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about people trying to power game it and swap out armors and carry things in their inventory and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, those are those are some of the major questions. They have an entire change log associated with every single chapter in the game, uh, as well as card updates specifically for the domains, uh, the communities, all that kind of stuff. You can check all of that out at daggerheart.com. They make it very readily accessible. And I believe the new game, quick start adventure and full playtest materials have been updated to the version 1.3 version as well, if you so desire to play with them. Do you have anything else you want to say about Daggerheart? Uh, I'm Same. waiting for 1.4 when they start requiring uh, stress tokens to make a phone call, because that's what my day to day life is like. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Modern Horizons 3, there's been some leaks. Uh, so when they spoiled Modern Horizons 3 uh, earlier when they did the, the big live stream in yes. the spring, uh, we got to see a preview for a Johnny Nakatl Pariah, which is a uh, flip walker, as they are colloquially known. Uh, this was a cycle that started a while ago. We saw it with Liliana and I believe Jace. And Chandra. And Chandra. And I think one more. Was it Nissa? Yes. And uh, what they are are cards that you cast as a creature on one side, and then you have to meet some kind of requirement that you can then flip to their backside where they're a planeswalker, telling the story of how they got their spark, very flavorful, and the cards generally are rather powerful as well. Uh, and a Johnny Nakato Pariah was one of the cards we saw. We talked about it previously. I thought it was very powerful. I'm a little bit colder on the card now. I still think it's good. It's still a good card. It's still a good card. Um very well costed for two mana all the creatures are very well costed and we also saw the art for tamio both pre and post spark post planeswalkering if you will but we act we have actual leaks for some of these like blurry image leaks not like the fake wizards of the coast spoiler season leaks where yeah. they just kind of show, start showing the cards off from the set uh, but we are getting close to modern horizons 3 so we probably will be getting full spoilers here in the near future but we have seen tamio we have seen soren we have seen rawl and we have seen grist now in their flipwalker forms and we're going to go over them now we first have tamio inquisitive student which is the creature side for a single blue mana she's flying when she attacks you investigate, which is create a clue token, and then when you draw your third card on a turn, you exile her, returning her to the battlefield, transformed to her planeswalker side. Uh, she's also a zero three. I didn't mention that. And uh, Tamio, seasoned scholar, is green blue, legendary planeswalker. Plus two, you can until your next turn, whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control. It gets minus one, minus zero oh until end of turn. You can minus three her to return a target instant or sorcery spell from your graveyard to your hand. If it's green, you add a mana of any color, and you can minus seven her to draw cards equal to half the number of cards in your library rounded down, and you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. Uh, her starting loyalty is two, so it will take you three upticks of her plus two loyalty ability to be able to alter her to draw half your library and have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. That's a very powerful walker. It's a one mana creature that's got a big old booty. Yeah. And flying. So and flying. A, a zero three one mana flying creature for blocking. When she attacks, she creates an, a, a, a clue token, which I find interesting because she's a zero three. Uh, but if you're drawing a lot of cards, which you probably are going to be doing in Simic, it'll be very easy to flip her. Mm -hmm. um, I think of, of the Planeswalker halves, her plus ability is probably by far the weakest. Um, and minus three, I think, is a little bit over cost to get an instant or sorcery card back to your hand, though it does generate a mana if it is a green card. Uh, but that minus seven ability is stupid powerful. It's one of those that I think uh, we, were, we were discussing a little earlier. Probably some ridiculous things that can be done for it. And mm -hmm. uh, once once somebody solves the card, it'll be like, oh, OK, that's that's why that that's a minus three. And suddenly, uh, you know green you know blue green storm yeah i agree i agree it'll be very powerful uh this is probably my least favorite of the flip hawkers we've seen though. yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not huge on this one um also not my play style in general so that's fair that's fair but something that is decidedly more my play style soren of house markov and soren the ravenous neonate soren of house markov is a one black legendary creature human noble uh one four 
Very well cost. Yeah. Two mana, one four with lifelink and extort. So whenever you cast a spell, you can choose to pay white or black. And if you do, each opponent loses a life and you gain that much life. Extort is a very powerful ability in, in Commander. At the beginning of your post-combat main phase, if you gained three or more life this turn, you exile him and then return him to the battlefield transformed into his Planeswalker side, which I want to note. If you cast a single card and you extort it each in a Commander game, each opponent loses one life and then you gain three. Yep. So all you need to do is extort a, a spell once and you'll be able to flip him. Soren Ravitus Neonate is a legendary planeswalker. Soren extort as well as a static ability. Static abilities on planeswalkers are very good with a beginning loyalty of three. You can plus two to create a food token. I hope there is a delicious uh, vampiric branded food token. Oh, that would, yeah. In the set sure. as well. For sure. Uh, and then you have a minus one where he deals damage equal to the amount of life you have gained that turn to any target, player, creature, battle <laughs> opposing planeswalkers a very powerful minus one ability and then a minus six ability to gain control of a target creature uh it becomes a vampire in addition to his other types and then you can put a lifelink counter on it if you control a white permanent other than that creature that you're gaining control of or soren himself uh this is probably in my estimation one of the more powerful planeswalkers from the flip blocker set or it cycle that we're getting here it is it is right in that Orzhov, uh, uh, you know, tunnel of things to do with life gain. Uh, intro, uh, not a huge amount of uh, uh, Orzhov things that create food tokens. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more so after uh, Wilds of Eldraine and uh, Lord of the Rings, but still, food on a food on a Soren, interesting. But yeah, even that minus one ability is going to uh, it could very easily rack you up a lot of damage on your opponents if you've been if you've been gaining a lot of life in a in a given turn also all you if you extort two spells that's six damage you can be throwing around the table which is going to get rid of a lot of threats even if you extort a single spell that becomes a that becomes a lightning bolt yeah oh yeah like that is a very powerful ability having extort on both sides is very powerful uh obviously i have a bias towards uh the vampires yeah but he is a human noble and then a planeswalker, so technically he's not a vampire, but he does become... Also true, also true. He does become a vampire when he uh, gets his spark, so that's a whole that's a whole other thing. I like Soren the most, by far. Uh, ooh, the next one's pretty good, too. Uh, Rawl, who is uh, on his front side, Rawl, Monsoon Mage, one in a red for a legendary creature, human wizard. Uh, one three, with the static ability of instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. That in and of itself would be a fantastic card. Yeah. Sure. A a red, a two mana, red, one, three. It's got a big booty, so it's a good blocker. And uh, it reduces the cost of all your instant and sorceries. Good card. Uh, probably one of the more difficult ones to flip, though. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell during your turn, you flip a coin. If you lose the flip, Rawl deals one damage to you. If you win the flip, you can exile him and return him to the battlefield transformed where you get Rawl Leyline Prodigy, legendary planeswalker Rawl, uh, enters the battlefield with additional loyalty counters on him for each instant and sorcery spell you've cast this turn. So if you're losing your flips and you're getting the damage dealt to you, you are then able to flip him when you do succeed on that turn with more loyalty counters, because he does start with only two loyalty counters and he has only a plus one, mm -hmm. which is until your next turn, instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. So now instead of a static reduction in cost for instants and sorceries, it has to be a plus one. Uh, his minus two is deals two damage divided as you choose among one or two targets. You draw a card if you control a blue permanent other than Rawl, you also get a minus eight for his ultimate, which is exile the top eight cards of your library. You may cast instant and sorcery spells from among them this turn without paying their mana costs. If you have a storm strategy, as you had mentioned before we started recording, um, it could be very easy. It would require a little bit of luck in losing some rolls um, because this is a whenever, so it is a triggered ability. So even if you throw a bunch of spells on the stack, he will flip before yeah. a lot of those spells resolve. You could also uh, make sure to have if you if for example if you're using him as your commander, probably not if you were having him in the nine nine. But if he was your commander, you'd probably include the couple of uh, cards that say when you flip a coin, you get to you know flip two and take Krark. your choice. Yeah, Krark that kind of stuff. I feel like this would go quite well in uh, Krark Sakashima partner decks. Or heads I win, tails you lose. Yeah, that kind of stuff. A lot of coin flipping uh, will go a long way. Um, 
it's go- what I the one problem I have with this. I love the static ability of uh, and the plus one ability on the planeswalker for cost reduction of instants and sorceries. The damage for the minus two is is whatever it is. You're kind of mostly doing that to draw a card because you want to have you would really don't want to be doing that unless you have a blue permanent so you can get the card draw off of it. That's where I think it becomes valuable. And it can also get rid of some pesky sure. creatures, your Ragavans, your Docksides, your whatever. Dockside, by the time it enters the battlefield, is already yeah, a problem. Matter. But uh, the pro- my biggest issue is the min- is the starting loyalty of two, so you can't immediately minus two him and keep him around. Um, that's my biggest thing. He does enter with... He's, well, he's guaranteed to enter... We'll start with, yeah, at least three because of the... Be- yeah. You'll have at least cast one spell in order to flip him. Exactly, exactly. So he will effectively start with three. That is true. Uh, but I still think that it is a little bit low. I wouldn't mind if his ultimate cost one less, Fair. two less, something like that. Uh, but the minus eight to ex- exile eight and get possibly up to eight free casts. Fair enough. Fair enough. The, it is a very powerful ability uh, if you hit a lot of instants and sorceries off the top. Uh, but the whole the whole theme of him is a little bit luck. A little so bit of luck, yeah. True. I'm okay with that. I think it's on theme. Probably my second... F- my second favorite, but I think objectively the most powerful one is uh, Grist. I like. I think Grist is my favorite. Oh, I absolutely. He he does everything that you like doing. <laughs> Grist, voracious larva, is a single green mana for a legendary creature insect. A two one with death touch. One two. A one two with death touch. <laughs> One, two is death touch. Whenever Grist, Voracious Larva, or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard, you may pay a green mana. If you do, exile him, return him to the battlefield flipped to his Planeswalker side. Grist, the Plague Swarm, legendary Planeswalker Grist, with starting loyalty of three, you can plus one him to create a one, one black and green insect creature token, then mill two cards. Put a death touch counter on the token if a black card was milled this way. Minus two to destroy an artifact or enchantment, and then minus six for his ultimate. For each creature card in your graveyard, create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a 1-1 one, one black and green insect. Mass graveyard reanimation. Mm-hmm. While also not actually reanimating them, so you can still do things like Liliana's Dreadhorde. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and and I think that's the right card. Uh, uh, invasion of the Dreadhorde? Invasion of the Dreadhorde, yeah. I Dreadhorde think. Invasion. Dreadhorde Invasion. We... Or any other mass reanimation spell, or you can Feld on to copy things in there, or you can Slimefoot and Squee to dive in and pull them out. I think this would go very well in your Slimefoot and Squee. The plus one, uh, just the plus one to mill. I... You like it. I like it. I know you like it. It would be very easy to flip him in a... Oh, absolutely. As well. Not really what I'm trying to do with my decks. Uh, I don't really have a graveyard recursion thing. So obviously you like Grist. I like Grist. I like Soren. You like Soren. Rao's pretty cool. Tamiyo I think is a little bit underpowered. But we're going to be... It seems like we're getting a proper uh, Flipwalker cycle here for Modern Horizons 3, which I think will go... Sorry, Modern Commander Horizons 3. Um, With that, we have five. So hypothetically... Either they finish. It's half of the uh, half of the color pairings. That's true. We got Boros. Uh, Boros. Yeah. Wow. The previous Gold ones. Gunnery. The previous ones were all the monocolor. Monocolor. Yeah. Flipwalkers as well. Yeah. Man, it, things are gonna get things are gonna get ridiculous. I like the flip blocker, the flip walker archetype as a whole. Yeah, I think it's cool. It's cool. It's I. Some of them aren't as power. It's. It's one of those things that a creature has to stick around. Mm-hmm. So it's much more, I feel like, commander, like casual commander powerful and not like powerful commander powerful. But I just I'm I'm excited to see when all of the different uh, when all of the different uh, commander gameplay shows do a flip walker battle of the flip walkers. It's yeah, like, that'll we've be fun. Each chosen a flip walker and built a deck around it. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. But moving on, we have a cowboy bebop promo card uh cycle that they're going to be releasing in the fall and next year jesus that will uh that will be very uh it it, they're promoting standard 
Thank yes, God. The standard so, showdown events held at local game stores. For the first time in a very long time. This will begin on August 2nd. That is the weekend of Gen Con. Yay. Mm-hmm. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, but you can get Cowboy Bebop promo cards by playing in the weekly standard showdown events held at your local WPN stores. There are five special promo cards. Uh, all of them are in traditional foil, and each will be distributed during those standard showdown events beginning in August. The first one, August 2nd to September 19th, is Ossification. That's the one in a white enchantment or where you enchant a basic land you control and then when it enters the battlefield you exile a target creature a planeswalker and opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield classic enchantment removal and and an enchantment for removal yes. for exiling the next one you have september 27th to november 7th for a disdainful stroke one in a blue instant counter target spell with mana value four or greater then November 15th to January 30th of 2025, you have Go for the Throat, one in a black for an instant, destroy target, non-artifact creature. February 7th to March 2nd of next year, you get Lightning Strike, one in a red instant, deals three damage to any target. And then lastly, the Snakeskin Veil, April 4th to May 29th of next year, 2025, instant speed, one green mana, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature, gains hexproof until the end of turn. All cards that see a very good amount of play in standard i love that you know they they've been trying to uh fix standard for a while now um last year they uh uh, extended the rotation i would argue that made the standard problem worse (laughs) arguably but uh yeah so if you're uh if you're if you got a standard deck head on down to your local uh wizards uh partner network store and Mm -hmm. uh Grab you some neat looking cards. Yeah. If you play standard, if you play standard every week, for one, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. But if you're playing every week, you're going to be getting a, more than a play set of all of these promos. Yeah. Which is pretty fun. You could you could eat them instead. Yeah. They're probably going to hold a fair bit more value. None of them are expensive cards no. to buy. Uh, so I think that'll be fun. Very they, cool. They also did a... Um animated promotion uh you can find that on youtube it it uses uh the thunder junction characters um and does it to the cowboy bebop theme and animation style the cowboy bebop promos also they use the thunder junction uh, characters but in the art style and poses from uh cowboy bebop so you got tiny bones on ossification you got oko on uh, disdainful strokes you got rakdos on go for the throat uh don't know who that is on I'm not sure whose it is. It's a blade on lightning strike. I don't know what that uh, is. That is the that is the thunder guns. I think from the from outlaw oh. from the from mm. the plane. And then you got Va- Vraska on the snakeskin veil. So which makes sense because she's snake. S- she's Medusa. <laughs> she's Medusa. All right. The last the last little thing. Sam Sam threw this in. Yeah. This uh, so of course this year is the 50th anniver- uh, anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and they have been announcing all sorts of collaborations. They got one going with Lego um, that we talked about last time. Well, another one they have is Converse. A wide variety of shoes for yes. Dungeons & Dragons, as well as some apparel. Um, I am not a shoe person at all, so I could not give less of a fuck about this. But I mean, it's it, you know, chucks are, chucks are a classic um, are. shoe from around the time. That D and D was coming out as well, uh, and and they're cool. They're cool looking, but they're you know the price of Chucks about uh, hundred. Chuck, Chuck Taylor All Star I think is the cheap or sorry yeah Chuck Taylor All Star one strap for fifty five dollars is the cheapest one. Yeah, most are about a hundred and ten dollars, ninety five to one hundred and ten dollars. That's you, just that's just fun. That's just neat. Um, you gonna get any? No, no, I don't have it in the. It's not uh, not in the budget. Not in the budget. Would you want one? I'm not going to go out of my way for it. You're not a you're not a Converse person, are you? Oh, I, I, my wife have Converse. Yeah, Converse, I have Converse. I don't. I don't. I have a Nike. A very basic Nike, but that's what I've said about you for years. You're a basic Nike. That is that is a thing to say about me, but. That is all the news that we have for this episode of the Duels and Mandrox podcast. We will then end this podcast as we end every podcast with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat because we record this live every week on TikTok. We, we, we will also eventually start taking we'll also eventually start taking questions from the Patreon and the like. But Sam, what do we got? Uh, a, a person that sometimes pops into our chat and we, we always remember. Uh, it's America. 
asking us no. if we're still not shredding our cards. No, we are not. No, we are not. Shred- we are not shredding our cards. Wow, that's been a while since since they popped in. That's, yeah, that's so. crazy. No, I would not. I would never do that. <laughs> Looking at the wall of cards that are valuable. No, I will not be doing that with my uh, mana crypt that I pulled from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Yeah, I will not be doing that. Um, other than that. Action DK twenty two asks, "Do you know why Plain Plain Quake is going for a lot of money?" No, no. it's probably difficult to get. <laughs> that would uh, is that one of the big show or big scorecards? Let's uh, Plain Quake. We have Plain Quake. Plain Quake MTG. Uh, Plain Quake Mystery uh, Booster Convention Edition. That would probably be why. Yeah, thirty dollars. Yeah, it's looks like what uh. Yeah, it's a special rarity card that you get from the Mystery Booster Conventions, which are boosters you can only get at conventions. So that would be why. I will say, if you look down the marketing price history... Uh, spiked up recently spiked in up. February. Interesting. What is it? Deals X damage to each creature without flying, and each Planeswalker of X is 10 or more. Open the Uncovered Cavern Plot Booster. <laughs> what the fuck? These playtest cards are wild, man. They are. Absolutely wild. They Anyway, that's about all. Uh, oh, MTG Crazy four, 345 says they love the art wall. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, what are those? Um, oh, my God. What are they? The, the, this plate. This there plate. There we go. There we go. This plate and that plate. Let's see. Plain Quake MTG Finance. Why is this card being bought and spiking out of nowhere? Yeah, this plot was a mentioned mechanic from the upcoming Outlaws of Thunder Junction set inside information or someone was huffing too much glue i vote for huffing glue yeah reddit is unhinged i imagine i imagine it was a plot booster thing what is a plot booster we're learning so much we're going this is the internet rabbit hole concept used in legacy style board games unknown element added to a certain game and thereby changing certain rules Connection with Magic the Gathering refers to named Uncovered Cavern was first mentioned in the playtest card Plain Quake in the Mystery Booster set. No such booster pack is part of that set in reality, much like contraptions weren't a part of Future Sight, though it was mentioned in the Steam Flogger boss. Maybe assume the plot booster would be opened. It's mysterious. Kind of... So it's kind of like how um, the booster tutor... Uh, yeah where you open a booster pack and then you can add one of the cards to your hand um but yeah i suspect that people started buying it because of plot would be my guess but i don't know how silly that's the one that makes the most logical sense for me or there's insider trading and someone knows something that we don't or someone's huff and glue that's kind of hot both of those options are kind of hot when you think about it don't have glue. Yeah, think about it. Nope. Think about it, though. That's kind of hot. I'm not going to have glue. That's hot. That's hot, though. It's hot. It's getting to be summer. The window's open. People have probably been hearing all the fucking cars and shit going up and down on the podcast, like right now. That, w- that one was squeaky. It was. Yeah. Anyway, so. Yeah. Well, well, next time we need to close the window. I completely forgot about that until we were like happy. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Anyway, that is all we have for this, the Lord's 65th episode of the Duels of Man and Orcs podcast. The podcast goes live every other week on Wednesdays at 1230 Eastern Standard Time. Daylight Time? Standard Eastern. Time? Is it st- Eastern Standard? Standard? It is standard right now? And, and the standard is always just the... Uh... Yeah, whatever. Eastern Time, 1230, every Wednesday. Catch it. Recorded live on the TikTok one day early on Tuesday at noon. Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music. Leave a review. All the podcast services around the globe, all that kind of stuff. And don't anything. forget to like and subscribe on YouTube, of course. Anything else you'd like to say? So? Uh, in the words of Fallout Boy, those dirty thoughts of me were never yours to keep. <laughs>